you know, I like to let Jeff every day had one of the kids come down and pray. Because so often, as adults, if I were to ask you to pray out loud in front of the congregation, you go, you want me not today. <laughs> I'm not really comfortable doing that here, you your job. But it's very real and important for us to teach our kids to be comfortable as they come before the Lord. Be comfortable praying, not only on their own, but in the assembly of believers. And so, as the Sundays go on, we're going to be having our kids each have a turn to pray. And I think that's such a very important thing for us all. This morning, our scripture comes from the book of Matthew. It's chapter 10. It begins with verse 24 and goes through 39. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, and you can follow along on the screen. Students are not greater than their teacher, and slaves are not greater than their master. Students are to be like their teacher, and slaves are to be like their master. And since I, the master of the household, have been called the prince of demons, the members of my household will be called even worse names. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when day of prayer comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jim Graves. And each week, 
Phelps would receive his challenge. His message via some kind of device, and he immediately, after it, uh, immediately after he heard it, the dice, the device would explode or implode or disappear in the vapor of smoke. From there, he either had to accept the mission and go forward to his next adventure or decline. His choice was apparent in that opening sentence, your mission, should you choose to accept it. But in the show, he never defined the mission. I mean, if he had, there would have been a show that week. You know, they would have gone straight to commercial. Each time Phelps though accepted the mission, he already knew that it was going to be dangerous. It, danger was a given. As he and his team went about boarding evil from the hostile iron government, curtain government, or third world dictators, or corrupt industrialists and crime lords, there were attacks on his life, there were death threats, dangerous pursuits, evil villains, and shrewd adversaries. Phelps knew the reality of his mission, and yes, he accepted to take on each and every one. Why? It was a TV show. Duh. Of course he accepted the mission. And what's a TV show about plot? But in the world of the imagination, Phelps accepted his challenges because he was deeply loyal to his organization. He was deeply loyal to his country and his sense of right and wrong for the world. He wanted to defeat evil and corruption and restore peace and order. It wasn't about money or fame. After all, his missions were always top secret. His reward came from knowing he had done the right thing, that he had protected the world from people who would seek to control and harm it. A positive outcome, though, was never easy to achieve. There was always a point in time where the tide could turn and Felton's team could be defeated. But they weren't. Like the good guy who always wears white, he always came out on top. And goodness prevailed. If you think about it, that is the hope of any mission. If it wasn't, why would you even undertake it? In our scripture today, Jesus is preparing his disciples for a similar kind of mission, a challenging mission, a dangerous mission. And he doesn't pull any punches as he prepares them for what lies ahead. He tells his followers straight up that if they accept this mission, they could and probably will encounter trouble and peril, death threats, and even worse. In the verses just preceding this morning's verses, Jesus tells them that he is sending them out as sheep among wolves. That persecution awaits them even in the most sacred place, the synagogue. That their families will be torn apart and all nations will hate them, just as they hate Jesus. But over and over and over again, he tells them not to be afraid because soon all that is secret will be made known. And, through their, and though their enemies may kill their bodies, they can't touch their souls. God's got them. And just as he cares for the sparrows that fall, he cares even more for them. Nothing will happen that the Father doesn't know about. With words of truth and promise, Jesus hopes his followers will take the risk and trust in him. For this mission will make a difference in the world. It is a life-saving kind of mission. The question posed to the disciples is posed to you and I as well. Will you accept this mission? Or in other words, are you with me or not? It is a question that we each need to answer. Having the scriptures in front of us and having heard them again and again, we know how the story plays out. The disciples did accept their mission, and it was filled with danger and death and torture and more. But they did not go into it unprepared. Like Jim Phelps from Mission Impossible, they were given some special instructions, some warnings, and some information about what to look out for. And even more important, Jesus gave his disciples hope and a promise for the future. 
No matter what the result of their mission, they would always win the prize. It was like a carrot, the goat, in front of a horse. They always were promised that they would get the carrot, that they would find the brass ring on the merry-go-round, that no matter what befell them, they would win. And what was that prize? The salvation of their souls. That even if they lost their life, even in death, like Jesus, they would still win. To you and I, sitting here today in 2023 in America, the loss of our physical lives may seem like too great a price to pay for religion or faith. Many of us would shudder to be asked to carry out such a mission today here in our country. And we wouldn't have to because up to this point, you and I have never been faced with the challenge of losing our life for our faith. We have been protected. We may complain about being persecuted for our faith in the halls of, just, of government or in the justice system or just in today's society, but Praise God, we haven't been faced with losing our life. As Americans, then it's hard to even fathom, and yet around the world, many Christians today are doing just that. They are proclaiming Jesus and his resurrection truth in countries where they know they face the good possibility of being persecuted, of being killed for espousing their faith. So why do they do it? Because like Phelps, they believe in their mission, down to the very depths of their soul, and they believe in the truth that Jesus promised that says they will always win in the end. Being Jesus' disciple is risky business. It was in the first century, and it is still today. To truly take on the responsibility of discipleship, we have to understand the cost. It requires that we each come to a moment of reckoning. We must accept Jesus' challenge or deny him. The choice is ours. To choose the life we want to live in the here and now as well as in the hereafter. They're both so tightly interconnected. And that's the message Jesus puts to all of his disciples. Those in the text from Matthew and to you and me. You can almost hear him say, and as you hear this, choose wisely. During Bible school, in one of the drawings that was acted out early in the morning, Legolas and Y. Sam Gamgee, and I'm not going to make them come forward and act it out, <coughs> started on their journey to save Legolas land from Lord Holy Board. And they walked and they talked. And it occurred to Sam that they didn't really know which way they were going. So he said and asked Legolas, what are we going to do? Where are we supposed to go? And Legolas told him that they were going to go and destroy Lord Mordor, the evil and sinister villain. So that meant they had to go to the one place that no one in Legolas land ever wanted to go. Chick, do you remember where that was? Mount Doom. Mount Doom, yes. Why Sam still didn't know the way though he knew the place. But being a shepherd, Legolas reminded Sam how the sheep know the shepherd's voice and how they always follow it. As they continued to walk, suddenly they came to, to a fork and road. <laughs> Jeff used that prop too. And they had to decide which way to go. Sam pointed one way and Legolas pointed another. One way on the sign that said, this way to the path of least resistance. While on the other sign that said, this way to the path of peace and resistance. Legolas and Sam argued about which way to go, which path to take. They wished they could just hear the voice of the shepherd so that they would know which way to go. They just needed some guidance. The path of least resistance or the path of the peace that resistance. 
That was their fork in the road. They had to choose the way that promised to be the easiest or the one that said it was the best way. In a sense, this is what it's like to choose Jesus' way. His mission, his call to accept his invitation to be a part of a kind of wilderness adventure of the soul. Even if you and I don't run into assassins, we're not tortured or experience threats like they did on Mission Impossible, or have to put up with the irks of life, you and I will encounter challenges just as like us and Sam did. You and I will encounter discouragement living this life of faith. We will encounter forks in our path. But despite the forks, at each of these moments in our life, we must continue to choose. And it's how we react in those situations that makes the difference. Will we acknowledge Jesus before others, or will we deny him? And I'm not talking about whether we will read the Bible, or go to church, or say the creed, or post Jesus-y kind of stuff on our Facebook page or on Twitter. I'm talking about how the way we live our life about what we say and what we don't say, what we do and what we don't do. The policies that we stand up for and we push for and support and the ideas behind them. I'm talking about where and with whom we make our stand today. What is it that we believe? What, who is it that we stand up for? Each time we encounter one of these situations, there's a struggle that happens inside of each one of us. And it's in those moments that we would just really like to take the easier way. To practice an easier, feel good kind of gospel. A gospel that are, affirms our lives just the way we're living them. And a gospel that just leaves us alone. A gospel that doesn't require so much of us. A gospel that doesn't step on our toes. I would really like it if there was a gospel that's easier to preach and easier to hear and easier to live out. But that isn't where Jesus brought us today. He has brought us again to the fourth world. Will you, will I, choose Jesus? More than here inside this church, will we choose Jesus to be the very foundation of our lives, in our lives, in our homes, in our workplace, in our sports life, in our other activities? Or will we choose the easier way? The choice is up to each and every one of us as individuals. You know, it's probably safe to say that when we multiple moments of reckoning in each of our lives where we encounter tragedies and dis disasters and sadnesses and frustrations. Time where we may falter in our faith, even for a moment. And we will wonder whether anything we're doing actually matters. We look for hints of success, whatever that means to each of us. And if we don't see them, we might become disillusioned. If it takes too long, we say, how long? We also might be afraid. Especially as we look to the fruit of our faith and we don't see what we want to see. It's easy to be discouraged. And yet each day, each hour, we continue to make a choice to follow Jesus and to accept his mission for our lives to answer the call that is uniquely yours and mine. Sometimes that call on our choices might be clear. Other times, we might face confusing forks in the path and ponder what we are to do. In the end, it's up to each of us as individuals to choose our own way. But in all of this, Jesus continues to assure us that we will arrive at our destination, that no matter whether it appears that our mission has failed 
for that we have won. If we stay true to the mission, we will arrive safely on heaven's shores. We will have completed our life's mission, and we have, will have secured our souls. For Jesus, success lies not in the outcome, but it's in the journey. Each of us plays a part in God's mission here on earth, and it is each and every one of us doing our part that completes God's kingdom picture, the one he has envisioned since the beginning of time. The same amazing mission that Jesus began and that his followers continue is your mission and mine. You and I are to continue to bring kingdom truth to earth, just as it is in heaven. But when will this mission finally be over? When will it be completed? Nobody knows but God. But as believers, each of us doing our part, what seems impossible now will someday become a reality. And so we live for the someday. So people of God, disciples of Jesus, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is this. To acknowledge and follow Jesus Christ, regardless of the consequences. Realizing that as the old Jew Jewish rabbi has written, it's not your responsibility to finish the perfecting work of the world, but neither are you free to abstain from it. Important words to remember. Those words hold a vision of the work before us, and I trust those words will lead you and me to be live lives that are worthy of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the challenge, the mission that you constantly put before us to stay strong in our faith. That when we come to a fork in the road where we must choose between you and the way of the world, we will choose you. Thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be courageous in the choice. So that when days are dark, we still trust in you. And when the sun shines, we praise you for the way you have lived and moved within each of our beings. Help us to be your disciples in a world where disciples are too few. Help us to be a light to others, especially to our children, to our family, to the ones we love most, to the ones that we are challenged to love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn is Take My Life. It's number 391 in the present.